Please take your seats. The program will begin in five minutes. Around the world, crowds rang in the new year. Some with hope. For others, 2023 looks uncertain. Russia's war in Ukraine rages on as Europe continues to navigate the energy crisis. UK households will pay almost triple the price to heat their homes this winter compared with a year ago. The cost of living is at an all-time high and central banks are going all out to tame inflation. We will stay the course until the job is done. A soft landing for the economy now seems unlikely. I don't know if it could be a soft landing. I don't think so. How can businesses respond to these geopolitical and economic challenges? There are risks, but also opportunities to create, innovate, to build and restore confidence. We bring together global chief executives to map out a blueprint for growth in 2023. This is the Bloomberg Year Ahead Summit at Davos. Please welcome to the stage Bloomberg's chairman, Peter Grauer. I would have thought those applause would have been a little louder. 
There we go. I mean, let's celebrate the fact that we're back in Davos together physically, which is very exciting and wonderful that you're all here. Thank you and a warm welcome to Bloomberg's year ahead. And whether you're joining us virtually or here in the room, thank you for being here. I'm Peter Grauer, the executive chairman of Bloomberg. I'm delighted to be back here in person in Davos in a room full of decision makers, thinkers, and influencers who will shape the future of business and society. This is the fourth year that we've hosted this event at the World Economic Forum annual meeting. And before we get started, I want to take a minute to thank our sponsors, Mubadala and Neom, for their support in making today's event possible. We're very happy to be working with them here in Davos. Each year, our goal is to provide you with key insights so you can plan for the issues and challenges you will face in 2023. And there are plenty. A rocky economy, an ongoing war, a changing workplace and workforce, and the constant threat of climate change. We have a stellar lineup of speakers today, including the CEOs of Citi, BlackRock, and Hong Kong Stock Exchange. We want you to be part of this conversation as well. So please scan the QR codes you see at the, on the screen, which will allow you to submit questions. And with that, it's time to get started. Thank you very much. Please welcome Larry Fink, Chairman and CEO of BlackRock, and Bloomberg's Francine Lacroix. having a good day. Thank you so much for joining us. Larry, thank you water. for joining us. Still, please. <laughs> I'm kidding. Any water will do. Larry, I have a lot of questions. Yeah. And I kept on saying, well, we asked all, hi, about everyone. the world economy. Do we talk about well, ESG? I, I have a board member here, so I got to be really careful. <laughs> <laughs> Larry, how much has the political backlash, thank you, to ESG investing had on you and BlackRock? Other than, be de uh, other than being dehydrated, um, <laughs> actually, if you just reflect on BlackRock's flows last year, um, the backlash, it's public, we lost about $4 billion of flows from various states. Um, but in long-term flows last year, we, we, we were awarded $400 billion uh, just this last year. Uh, in the United States, our clients entrusted us with an additional $230 billion. So uh, you tell me, $4 billion out and $230 in, in the U.S. On the other hand, let me be clear. Uh, I'm taking this very seriously. Uh, we are trying to address the misconceptions. Uh, it is, uh, it's hard uh, because it's not, it's not business anymore. They're doing it in a personal way. And in the first time in my professional career, um, ta attacks are now personal. Um, they're trying to demonize issues. Um, in terms of all, long, you know, we're sitting here in Europe. Um, if you do not have a lens towards uh, decarbonization, you're not going to win one, one euro of business. And so um, we talk about choice. It, it, you know, we, we are one of the largest hydrocarbon, if not the largest hydrocarbon uh, investor in the world uh, because we're the largest indexer and we're, we work with all these different companies. At the same time, we're one of the fastest growing companies related to decarbonization. And let's be clear, the IRA in the United States is a game changer too. And we're seeing more and more companies who are looking to partner and doing things. And uh, in, in our conversations in Europe, we're, we're hearing all the Europeans are looking to have a, a similar response. So l let's be clear, the narrative is ugly. The narrative, um, is creating this huge polarization. If you really read the CEO letters that I've written in the past, I talk about um, 
a, a uh, transition has to always be fair and just. But has it taken a personal toll on you? Are you, are you promoting? I, it, it's hard for me to lose assets. much more hair. <laughs> 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 no, I, it's not enjoyable, you know, seeing trucks with, you know, with a picture of me standing next to some other people that are DMI, deified. So um, it's, uh, it's not, look at, I, I, in, when I meet our clients, when I meet our clients um, in Europe, our clients in the Middle East, in Asia, when I meet our clients in red states and blue states, I'm actually rewarded about the depth of our conversations. I mean, I, 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 another example of what we are doing with our clients, we're winning more and more of the entire portfolios of their pension funds than ever before. And this is not, uh, this is, you know, we actually won the entire pension plan of a major hydrocarbon company, a major energy company. You know, if we were that enemy uh, that it, we're being, um, we're being, accused of, I don't think we would have those type of relationships with them. We're working with one or two major energy companies right now on their pathway on decarbonization. And so, as I, my letters wrote, we have to be working with energy companies, not against. I've always said we are hostily against um, 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 divestiture. Divestiture, it just moves from public hands to private hands. And so, even in the first letter when I talked about um, decarbonization and climate, that was in 2020, and all the things I've said are still true today. Unfortunately, there are some politicians who are taking some sub parts of a sentence out of context, and, it, and that's the world we live in today. But does it make you rethink actually promoting no. some of those no. products in America? No, because I, if you reread what I said, um, a transition has to be fair and just. Right. A transition is not gonna be a straight line. Obviously, when I wrote letters, I never anticipated a war. I never anticipated the, a disruption of, of a major energy producer. So we have all those issues. But no, I, I, it, it, in winning $400 billion of long-term flows from our clients, I think that is telling you that our voice is still, you know, is even more resonating with our clients than ever before. And, and, and you know, 99% of our clients' flows are private flows. The few that have wanted to make it a political statement, um, I, I could promise you we treat every client individually. I think we have won more business because of our long term performance. The guidance we give, what Phil and BII does in terms of giving people a better understanding of what we think we see in the world, and our fiduciary standards at an individual client level to everyone is as strong as any firm. What's your relationship like with Juan DeSantis? He says you're politicizing investing. Have you tried to convince him otherwise? We are doing everything we can to try to change the narrative. Let me just leave it at that. So, so you've met with him? What I'm not going to go into who I meet and who I talk to, <laughs> especially not, <laughs> not, on the, not with his audience. <laughs> um, Larry, talk to me about your annual letter. Is it coming? Or do you still enjoy writing those? Uh, well, I did write a letter in November on, on, on voting choice. Uh, so I did have a letter on voting choice in November, which was very well received. And other, other people in the journalistic field said, no firm is doing more to democratization vote than BlackRock. Uh, and I think that's true. No firm is trying to bring back the vote to the individual asset owners. We're not an asset owner. We're the asset advisor. Uh, and then... Um, uh, a, a letter is coming out sometime this quarter, yes. Focused on? I'm not gonna get into that. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll give you a major <laughs> theme. The, probably the big theme is hope. That's gonna be, that is my word of the, of the moment that I'm really using it, I'm using it here. Um, hope uh, for a better economy? Uh, no, <laughs> the, the whole concept of hope. A COVID um, has really changed how we think, the fear, of mortality, it has, was developing the world, um, the polarization, the politics, a war. If you look at birth rates in the world, they're collapsing in the developed world. I mean, you don't bring a child in the world unless you believe tomorrow is better than today. If you look at the savings rates in the world, the savings rates have mounted up dramatically in the world. Um, BlackRock is a firm that tries to sell hope because why would anybody put something into a 30-year obligation unless you believe something is better in 30 years? 
Um, and say, you know, more and more money has been held. In China alone, there is an estimated $2.7 trillion of more savings in the system. It, it, it's, you know, it's in the, high, the savings rates in China are in the high 40s. People are not investing in the future. They don't have that, you know, the safety nets of healthcare and, and retirement. And, and so we're losing hope. And the polarization of politics, the, you know, which, which media source do I even believe in? Bloomberg. Okay, fine. <laughs> you, know, you need to get that out. <laughs> no, but, uh, but Francine, more and more people are frightened of, of the realities of today, and that's manifesting in so many areas, and so that's going to be a yeah. major thing, but and I, I talk about that a lot if, today. If you look at hope, then it has to be backed up by a better world, a better economic situation, inflation going down. How do you see that progressing? Well, that's, that's you know... When I talk about hope, I'm not talking about you know whether the markets are up or down in the next 12 months. But I mean, standards of living. Pardon me, but standards, standards of living right? have to grow. Obviously, right. wages, and we're seeing that, and, and people have to feel more comfortable. And I'm not just talking about a, a phenomenon in, in in Western Europe or or the or North America. I'm talking about the world, and and um, and there's less hope in the world today. Do, do you see the world uh, getting better, so economically? Sure. Look at, I, you know, last year was a year of transition in so many ways. I mean, obviously, the first time in 40 years, and this impacted BlackRock and our earnings that I reported on Friday, we had um, bond market down 13%, global equity markets down 18%, and then for us, the dollar appreciated dramatically. But if you just, if you were on a desert island for all the last year and you had a pool of money today, you have greater abilities to invest today than you did a year ago and two years ago. Um, if you look at a, st a, a normal retirement portfolio, and this is something that we don't spend enough time on, a typical retirement portfolio in, in, in around 2002-03, you could have owned 40 to 60 percent in bonds and earned your your your, your return of seven and seven eighths and eight and, and eight. By 2020, you could not own a bond. I mean, so you had to take so much illiquid risk. I mean, think about the growth in privates and, and private equity. Why? Because you could not make a return in bonds. Today, with, you know, you could get 4% in short-term treasury, you get 5% in credit, 8%. In, right. You could now go back and have a, I would say, a, a, a better portfolio, a better asset allocation, today than three years ago. You could reformulate it and, and bring down your illiquidity right. risk. And the, the question Where, that we all have to ask as yeah. investors, do you believe we're going to have more liquidity in five years than we do now? I don't think so. I think we're not going to have the support of Federal Reserve for years to come or central banks. Uh, we saw the limits of fiscal stimulus in the UK and every other government is now facing that. And so the reality is, we are going to have less liquidity, right. and, the, and it has to be market-based liquidity. So how much illiquidity do you, do you want if you're yeah. running a retirement plan? So and so the big issue is, is bonds play yeah. a bigger role today than they did in the last so Larry, seven, eight years. where do you put your money in the next 12 months? <laughs> I, look, at, I'm, a, I'm an optimist. <laughs> I, I'm, Clearly. I'm, I have had a portfolio in equities my whole life, or some form of equity-related yeah. assets. I'm, you know, even at my age, I'm not changing that view. Uh, so, I, you know, I don't allow market, markets like today. Let's getting back to PEs. PEs are more realistic today than they were two years ago. I could go on and on and on. We're spending so much time focusing on the tragedy or the, the recalibration of last year. But the reality is um, there are better valuations in companies today than there were two years ago. Uh, you can earn a better return in, in bonds than you did two years ago. And so we're festering on what happened last year and all the travails. And we're talking about, oh, gosh, is inflation going to be, you know, how fast is it going to fall? Let me be clear. Inflation is falling. The question is, can it fall to, the, to, to, the, to a 2% rate, which I question it will. I don't even know why we have a 2% target. That's a, you know, I've raised that question many times. Could inflation bring, be brought down to 3 3.5%? Three Absolutely. Yeah. Now, does that mean the central banks are going to keep rates higher for longer? Maybe, and that's the issue that I have related to liquidity. So you think market, what markets get wrong, is, is they're too pessimistic? Um, 
I'm not here to tell you we can't have another uh, problem. I think the, the world is pretty in, uh, unstable. Let's be clear. What moves the energy valuation is 500,000 to a million barrels. You know, if, the, if China's economy rebounds after the, the uh, when, they, when, when, they, when the country has herd immunity, which I'm told is happening very rapidly. I mean, three weeks ago we had nobody in our offices there, now everybody's back, and I hear that from every CEO that I've met in, um, here in Davos. Uh, it, you know, it is estimated that the Chinese economy can grow five or six percent in the third and fourth quarter. If that's the case, does that mean, are they gonna demand an extra 500,000 million barrels of oil in that? At the same time, we're, we're, we're estimating a mild recession in Europe and, and the United States does that, off, that offset it. If not, I mean, the trends would say we're going to have more, we're going to have elevated energy prices again right. from where it is today, if, if that's the case. What does that do in, to inflation? And so all I'm trying to say is, I'm not here to suggest it's going to be rosy for, in 2023, but what I'm saying for long-term investing, it's not so bad. It's a better environment for long-term investing today than it was two years ago, and that's the myth. So g given what you've explained, are private markets less of a draw now? Yes, um, but not in infrastructure, not in sustainability. That's where, because you're going to get much higher coupon. I mean, the beauty of infrastructure and, and is, you, you know, it, it throws off higher income. And so I think it's just going to be a recalibration to more income-oriented privates, illiquids, uh, than look, but you know, we do a survey every year, um, and the last two year surveys were at epic proportions about how many investors w were were going to put more and more money in illiquids. Now they needed to because of because of the, the bond market. Um, when you see that type of uh, overwhelming statistic, generally that's wrong. You know, the herd herd mentality never works. So, um, so. Um, I, I think, I think, you know, we're still living the pain of last year, but I think the opportunities in 2023 are far better than they were in the last few years. I have a couple of questions from the audience, so thank you so much for sending them in about liquidity. You suggest it will be worse. Uh, it seems like the, the last 30 years liquidity has broadly improved. Why, why do you think in five, 10 years it could get worse? I just don't see fiscal stimulus happening anytime soon. We need, I, I, you know, what I, you know, I don't, I, what I worry about most, yeah, you didn't ask me that question. I don't worry Not about, I, I don't worry <laughs> about inflation as much. I worry about is anemic growth for the next five to seven years. I don't know how we're going to get out of this 2% growth rate. And that's my bigger issue. We're not going to have the fiscal abilities unless we grow to add on more fiscal uh, stimulus. And we're certainly not going to have accommodative central bank behavior for the next few years by any means. So what would be your growth plan if you were in charge of the large economy? Uh, well, I, I do believe, um, um, look, at, uh, another thing is for in the last two years, certainly since the Ukraine invasion, is we hear national security coming up all the time. Okay, we much, for national security, Europe needs to have its own ships. For national security, the US needs to build its own ships. For national security, we need to have more independence of energy, whether it's renewable or, or, uh, or hydrocarbons. Let's be clear, when we all talk about national security and we do it all individually as, as nations, that's inflationary. So we're going to, you know, we're going to be creating more and more redundancies. Ultimately, that's deflationary, but but longer term. But it's that's longer term. term. So um, I, um, I'm not that I'm not that worried that two percent is a, is a is a bad outcome. I think it's certainly a better outcome than the last year or so, where we needed so much fiscal stimulus and monetary stimulus to get the economy going. And you know, if we could just without that government support that we could create uh, an economy of 2%. Plus, where I'm going to be wrong, where we may have 3 or 4% growth is if we have another technological changes. What role does AI play in, in, in terms of productivity? Let's be clear. A, ma a major component of why we had such high inflation is no one wants to talk about um, productivity collapsed d during remote working. Remote working has not worked. But does AI also lead to job losses? Well, 
Last I checked, we have labor shortages in Europe uh, and in the US. Uh, so a little combination of new technology um, is probably gonna be helpful, unless, uh, unless uh, the Europeans and, and Americans open up our borders for more immigration. I'm not calling for that. Yeah. But a good example in, in terms of US policy, the US changed our legal po immigration policies. We're down in the United States two and a half million legal immigrants in the last five years. We've made it much more restrictive for legal immigration. And I'm not talking about migrants. I'm talking about pure legal immigration. We've stopped that, too. Um, Larry, we're almost out of time, but we spoke to the, well, a Ukrainian official who said they hoped that BlackRock would, would put money in the country. What can you tell us? Well, it's public what we're doing. We, we've been hired by the Ukrainian government um, to help them build a um, reconstruction fund. We have our whole team there tasked in, in building out the team, making sure we have the organizational structure in place, that we're gonna help them hire the right team, um, that uh, Ukraine will be a great place for public money to, uh, to yeah. help restore it. What I told President Zelensky is our job is to make sure that the opportunities for private capital can come to Ukraine and we can get a fair and just return. He agreed on that. Uh, he agreed on the role of capitalism in his country for that. And um, I told uh, the president uh, that uh, our job is to make sure that uh, the new Ukraine is an open society, open economy, that, that if they are looking for that type of capital, um, the, the capital will be there. And, um, and we've had many dialogues with them, and we'll have another dialogue with them later today. All right, Larry Fink, thank you so much thank for joining you. us. Thanks, Vincent. Please welcome Jane Frazier, the CEO of City, and Bloomberg's David Weston. Okay, thank you very much. It's a pleasure, a real pleasure to be here with Jane Fraser, the CEO of City. Before we start, let me remind you, QR codes on those cards on your table. If you want to ask questions of Jane, put them in. If I can manage to operate this iPad, then we'll ask those questions. So Jane, thank you so much for doing this. It's great. Well, it's, it's wonderful to be here. It's lovely to see so many friends and also so many clients of ours in the audience. So. Thank you very much. So she's doing business at the same time. Of course, uh, uh, aren't we all? I must say the first time I ever heard of City, which was long, long mm -hmm. before I was at Bloomberg, it was international, going all the way back to Walter Riston. And you've said global is at the very core of your identity at City. At the same time, the meaning of global and globalization is in flux, I think it's fair to say. It's not as easy as it once was. What does that mean for the global economy, from your point of view, and what specifically does it mean to City? Oh, there's, there's a huge amount that's out there around this globalization debt. And sitting at the uh, privileged seat of the helm of a, a very global institution, I can unequivocally say it isn't dead, but it is certainly changing. Um, uh, and the ways that we see it changing, both digitization has been transforming industries and connectivity, but between a pandemic, a war, um, geopolitical tensions, other pieces, we're seeing um, a, a focus on resiliency around the world for our clients. Um, and that translates into, uh, we, Larry touched on a few of them, but it translates into energy security, it translates to food, water security, financial security these days, um, and uh, you know the, li the list goes on. But um, we've seen it with supply chains, we've seen it with companies' operations. There is this new thinking much more about operational risk, um, and that's become a much more dominant part of globalization. And as we heard from Larry, I couldn't agree with him more. Um, these trends are driving more complexity um, into globalization. Um, those complexity costs can all be managed, but they are expensive. Complexity is one word for it. Another might be friction. There's more frictions from all those sources you identified. Does that inherently mean there's a drag on global growth, economic growth, and specifically, does it mean there's a drag on city growth? No, I, we, we've seen extraordinary growth. So if, I go, if we go back to, w to what city is, um, we're essentially the, the bank of choice for 
uh, clients who have cross-border needs. We operate in 100 countries around the world um, with a local bank, and we, w we wake up in about 160 that we'll do business in. But our, our core clients are 5,000 multinationals, and we move $4 trillion of volume just for those 5,000 companies daily in foreign exchange, in payments, in, um, tr in trade, and really everything that they need to operate their payrolls um, and their, their core supply chains and treasury businesses. That business last year grew its revenues for us by over 30%. I mean, the volumes have um, exploded as clients have moved around, supply chains have been reconfiguring, additional supplies have been added in, folk have been looking beyond China to look at, not necessarily a pivot away, but what is the additional um, areas of supply chains that say in India or Mexico, um, parts of, uh, all parts of Asia have been benefiting from as well. So that, that shift in mix is, uh, it has been adding growth opportunities, not taking it away, which so is not always intuitive. Those are very impressive numbers. How much of that is the overall size of the pie growing? That is to say, cross-border transactions growing, as opposed to city taking market share from others? Um, we have taken market share, I'm delighted to say. In fact, we're about a year ahead of the plan that I, or two years ahead of the plan and we put in place a year ago. It says I must have lowballed those numbers. Um, but when we, when we look at it, I think the piece I'm really excited about are the mid-market companies because they're, what we're seeing is they're either born digital players or they're ones who are participating in expanded global supply chains and they're growing incredibly rapidly. So that's one of the areas of growth that we see the biggest opportunities. And you see it in the Middle East as they're looking at expanding and diversifying, diversifying away from fossil fuels, adding more diversity into their economies. We're seeing it in you know, the extraordinary entrepreneurs that are around the world, um, really taking advantage of the trends going on. Recession, something everyone's talking about, speculating yeah. about, nobody knows. Uh, I believe you said in the past, at least, you think it's quite possible there'll be a recession in the United States second half. Also, you've talked about recession in Europe. Is your view on that changing? Because th some of the economic numbers are coming in a little bit more reassuring. Some people, even like Larry Summers, he still thinks it's more likely than that, but he's yeah. not as gung-ho on recession as he once was. Where are you? So we, we do have, we do, what we are seeing is different countries are at very different places, so you actually cannot speak in generalities. We expect to see a rolling series of country recessions, but short of anything, crazy happening geopolitically, and this time last year we wouldn't have predicted what happened in the Ukraine. Um, you've seen the tails come in, so you've seen the over-optimism from some about uh, soft landings and the economy's doing well, but equally you've seen the, down, the severe case downside also coming in. I think the general view in the States, certainly one we hold at City, is we expect to see a mild recession, um, largely driven by the painfully persistent service inflation. Um, it's coming off, but it's still pretty high, and we do expect to see central banks continue tightening as a result. Um, but the vulnerability that amplified previous recessions around the world are not present. You know, banks are in very good shape, consumer balance sheets are in good shape, corporate balance sheets are in good shape, and I think that omens well for a m mild recessions when they come, um, rather than ones that we have to be worried about. Uh, uh, do we know exactly the state of the economy? Because there's a lot more that is in private, behind uh, closed walls, that since the great financial crisis, because of some of the regulations a lot has moved out of banks like yours that are highly regulated. Are we confident we know the situation? I, to the extent that anybody can be confident, um, you know, we, we serve clients across the spectrum, not just those that are in the public markets, but the private asset space is, is a very important one. And we certainly see um, very healthy corporate balance sheets across the board. Um, our net credit losses from the commercial bank and from our corporate banking business in the last year, I've never seen them so low. Um, and I think this, this omens well in our M&A activity, for example, the number of dialogues that we're having with CEOs about truly transformational M&A at the moment is enormous. It's not quite the pipeline it was last year, um, but it is a pipeline that, um, as prices have become more reasonable and corporate balance sheets are in good shape, 
that um, CEOs are thinking transformation much more than you might think, despite the fact that there's also an adjustment to the reality of um, more mild recessions um, ahead. Well, as you, as you suggested, there may be rolling recessions, different yes. places in the world at different yep. times. Uh, what does that mean for you as CEO of City? How do you manage that situation if that comes to pass? Uh, well, one has a wonderful team, <laughs> which is always very useful, and we have a team of, uh, around the world who's very used to managing a portfolio of very different situations. And when we look at where the world has been uh, over even the last couple of years, it, it, it's pretty resilient around many of the different changes and issues that are there. So we, we do stress tests constantly. Um, we do stress tests of things I never imagined doing stress tests of, um, and they are multi-dimensional, multi-faceted, um, and then we make sure that we are in extremely good, rude health ourselves to be able to support clients where they need us, either seizing opportunities from this or playing defense um, and make sure that we're there to support them. You're in the midst, I believe, of the transition right now, putting yeah. your own stamp, your own strategy on City. Uh, and, and it has various aspects to it. You've laid out what the core businesses of City are. Well, let's start actually with some of the retail banks and some of the locations, such as, for example, Banamex in Mexico, but yeah. it's only one of several. How did you go about deciding that? And particularly, how are you managing margins? How are you picking the places around the world where you think you can make money, as opposed to the ones that, frankly, you'll never make a lot of money? So we, we looked at it and said, uh, as we looked at all the dynamics that are going on around the world, and we looked very dispassionately at our businesses and our position, and we said we want the bank to be simpler, focused, and better connected. And the businesses, therefore, we operate in need to be very connected together, and they all need to hang together to really serve cl um, the, cl the core client set, which are clients with cross-border needs. Um, and so we... Um, we took the dispassionate view that we would double down on the investments, driving the connectivity and driving some of the cultural change to get uh, the firm to really operate the four core businesses that serve that client base around the world to um, standards of excellence in everything that they do. Um, and that therefore meant that we would exit um, the other businesses where we, we made the view that we weren't the best owner of and it was therefore in the shareholders' interest that we divest them. We reinvest some of that money into um, making sure that our businesses are truly set up for the decade ahead, and also to return the money to our shareholders. The biggest may have been Banamex in, yeah. in Mexico. Uh, I'm sure you're asked this incessantly, but where are you in that process? Oh. I saw the <laughs> president said it's down to two bidders, but do you have any guess about a time horizon? Oh, I can give you, I have far more than a guess, but I'm afraid I'm not going to disclose <laughs> that today. Uh, we're, in, we're in very active dialogue there, um, and we're running through a dual process, both IPO and sale of the business. But that, it's, uh, it's at the consumer businesses there. Um, Mexico is a very important country in the world, particularly with the dynamics that are going on. And so um, we, are, we are retaining our institutional franchise there, which really connects Mexico to the world and the world to Mexico. And we've never seen so many inquiries from institutional clients around the world, be it in Japan, be it in Germany, be it in the States, be it even from others looking at diversifying um, beyond China um, into Mexico. And uh, we're pretty bullish about the opportunities from that side. We're just not the best owner of the consumer franchise there. I must say, I've been through a corporate transformation or two myself, and they're never easy in my experience. Mm. Uh, and, and they're necessary, but never easy. One of the things you, you focused on... You just get on with them. Well, but <laughs> one of the things you focused on was wealth management. Yes. And then you've just announced you're going to have a, a change at the head of wealth management. Mm -hmm. That consumes a fair amount of, uh, of uh, bandwidth for the executive team. It sort of slows things down, in my experience, typically. When you're not sure who's in charge, it slows things down. Did you mm. anticipate that? No, I w um, we had had a head of the wealth management business for a couple of years who had really helped us integrate five or six different parts of the bank into a single division and put it into an integrated platform. And so we felt it was about the right time to then look at a shift in, in leadership. It was no more complicated than that. And uh, if a shift in leadership of a division slows the division down, you've got bigger issues than that. <laughs> and it won't slow us down. Um, so, uh, no, I think it's just part of the normal evolution as you, um, as you move talent around and 
the head of that business is moving into another very important role in the firm. Um, I, I, my career has benefited from moving talent um, and growing by managing different businesses, and I, I think it's very important to do so. When you get through your transition, yeah. what's your comparative advantage for City? Why do oh. you beat the other guys? Well, we already have a, a private bank. The average net worth of our private bank client is about $450 million. Um, and that's, that's a lot. And these are the families who are the entrepreneurs that are shaping the world economy. Um, either they, they, they're typically first or the second generation, um, and they are the ones that know city well um, because we've helped them go global, uh, we've helped them grow, uh, we've helped them transform, and so they know and trust us as their core partner, and there are tremendous synergies and linkages across the bank from the banking franchise, our markets franchise to help them manage risk, as they go global, um, raise up the financing they need. They're, they become family in many respects as well, and that, that's a huge competitive advantage. And our commercial bank is present in almost 40 markets around the world, has been for many years, and so um, that's, a, that's an important engine. So we have a, we have a huge competitive advantage there. ESG, environmental, social, and uh, yeah. governance. For I've the longest it. time, it was a darling. Everybody wanted to talk about it was good. <laughs> now it's become quite polarizing, at least in some parts, certainly of the United States. And we've heard yeah. the likes of Lori Fink say they lost $4 billion, although they made up more than that in inflows. What's your experience at Citi? Have you lost money because of ESG? No. Um, but, but I think that's not really where we're focused. So when we look at it, the world's got a number of major transitions that we're going through. And to your point, these aren't, these aren't easy ones. So where we're focused on is helping, let's take climate, we're trying to make sure that there is both the realization of energy security um, for the world, which is critically important for economic growth, at the same time is that there is the investment and the innovation required in sustainable um, green sources of energy and cleaner sources of energy. And we've got to solve both of them together. They're not mutually exclusive. Um, so our focus is trying to move the noise out the way and actually roll up our sleeves and get on with the hard work of how do we um, help support our clients who are investing in the innovations, get them to scale, that will get those cleaner technologies that we need up and running at the same time as supporting clients who are also critical sources of energy um, for the world right now and helping them with that transition but recognizing this takes time. And, and how much of your time do you spend on making sure you're not part of the noise? Because it strikes me a lot of CEOs have inadvertently become poster childs of one side or the other in some of these issues. How do you make sure Jane Fraser doesn't get to be one of those poster well, childs? I, I think it's maybe the benefit of being a fairly new CEO is that you're pretty focused on doing your day job. So you get pretty good at moving the noise out the way and just getting on with it. Don't find that difficult. W one of the things we've had to deal with uh, because of the pandemic is working from home, as yeah. it's called. And, and you've been uh, fairly outspoken, I believe, on the subject, and not necessarily the same position as some other leaders of banks. And my, my more specific question is, in your experience, do you track productivity for people who work from home as opposed to people coming to the office? And if so, what have you found? Well, I, I'll, I'll get to that, but I would, I'd start off just by saying that I think the, the positions that we've taken where we're recognizing we're going through a very human crisis during the pandemic was one that um, was an advantage for us in being able to attract and, and retain and get the most out of our talent. And we do measure productivity very carefully. And I, I am incredibly proud of our people and what they did in terms of supporting clients, supporting communities, um, through some very, very difficult times around the world. Our, our team in Ukraine, we have a bank there. Um, it did extraordinary things to help support the Ukrainian economy and, and keeping the doors open every single day. So I'd start from that point of view that I, I do think that there are win-wins here. Um, and I think you've got to be mindful of what are the needs of your people at different points in time and making sure that you're addressing them so that they can deliver excellence to clients and to the job. That, I think, so what did we learn? We learned that um, you are, that we do want people collaborating, in, and they do collaborate better together. Apprenticeship is really important. I know when, when I grew up, I kind of learned the hard way by watching and learning from um, certainly some eccentric and wonderful characters that uh, taught me 
Um, and that apprenticeship model, that feedback is important. And it does happen when you tend to be together more readily. But at the same time, we don't have to go back to the 80s model that sort of epitomized Wall Street either. And you know, we try and send more of our juniors home at the end of the day so they can work from there. So I think there's a, I do believe that there's an important balance here. Um, in productivity, you can see how productive someone is or isn't. And if they're not being productive, we bring them back to the office or back to the site, and we give them the coaching they need until they get their productivity back up again. I think the bigger question's going to be when we get through the next couple of years, what happens to the labor supply? I think we're in for a world of pretty tight labor supply. We're not seeing people coming back um, who had left the workforce in anything like the numbers we expected, and that's even with a pending recession and some of the inflationary challenges. So I think we're going to have to keep listening to our people and getting that balance right. Um, but if you don't listen to them, I think you're in danger of having some problems. I want to wrap up with one question yep. from the audience here. And I'd not be a faithful reporter if I didn't include the compliment. <laughs> it says, hi, Jane. Firstly, congratulations on a fantastic runway you're building in city. So there you go. But this is a really important question. When will we see Citi play a bigger role in key emerging markets, and it lists specifically India, Uzbekistan, yeah. at all? It is a terribly important question, because as we talk about the global economy, yeah. some of the economies are getting left behind, certainly not India, no. but there are economies that are getting left behind. Yeah. How much is that an impediment to overall growth? Yeah, look, there are some economies, uh, India is one I, um, I, I visited in July, which you only visit in July in the middle of the group. It's very, very important to you given how hot it is there. It's, it is fascinating. What an extraordinary economy. It's amazing to see what's going on there. Middle East, also amazing to see what's going on. A lot of the discussions we're having, particularly interestingly with a lot of our Middle Eastern clients, is what are they doing about Africa? I, I, and I think Africa is one that we've all got to keep our mind on because that is where the net growth in the workforce is going to come over the next few decades. Um, if we get it right, it's a wonderful opportunity. If we don't, it's going to cause a lot of problems both in Africa as well as in Europe as well as other parts of the world. And so looking at how do we build out transmission networks, greener supply chains there, get that middle class, get the SMEs uh, operating there healthily. That's very important. Um, and yes, we should all focus on it. It's also wonderful when we do enable progress around the world. That's a good thing. Indeed. Thank you so much. This is Jane Fraser. She is the CEO of City. Great to have Thank you. Thank you very much. Please welcome to the stage Dr. Manar Al Monif, Chief Investment Officer of NEOM, and Bloomberg's Jessica Weber. Dr. Manar, thank you for being with us today. Thank you so much for having me. Good afternoon, everyone. We've obviously just seen this video, and I'm sure, like many of us here today, we, we've all seen, and Neom feels like it's everywhere. We've seen the snowy mountains, we've seen the linear city, the island resort. But what is Neom? Well, thank you so much for giving me this opportunity to explain exactly what Neom is, and it's so good to be with a lot of colleagues and friends here today. So NEOM, let me start by the definition of the word NEOM. So it's simply NEO, which is in Greek new, and OM, which is uh, in the Arabic word mustaqbal, which is the new future. It's a region in the northwest of Saudi Arabia, spread across 26,500 square kilometers. It's at the shores of the Red Sea, strategically located, where, uh, where around 13% of the world trade passes through NEOM on a daily basis. And it's six hours flight from 40% of the world population. Nice. The way we look at NEOM and we try to present it, it actually represents a global opportunity for everyone. A global opportunity to do three different things. 
The first one is a global opportunity to redefine sustainability of how can we build and protect our future together. NEOM is going to be powered by 100% renewable energy, but we're not stopping at 100% renewable energy. We're actually laying the foundation toward a net zero carbon society. The second thing we're trying to do is redefine livability by providing an exceptional quality of life to people, giving them access to sustainable food, a vibrant international community, as a, and a diverse landscape. And that's going to come to life through our regions that we'll speak about later on. And finally, we're trying to redefine businesses by allowing businesses to grow in Neom faster than anywhere else around the world. And that's going to happen due to a, a region that actually is free from any legacy outdated infrastructure, coupled with progressive laws and regulation that will allow the businesses to focus on creativity and innovation, and a set of attractive incentives that will allow them to grow faster than anywhere else around the world. The economy in Neom is going to be pioneered and uh, driven by 14 different economic sectors that we've outlined, which is going to be the future sectors uh, in Neom. And it is through these sectors that we're actually redefining energy, so it powers our life sustainably. We're redefining mobility, so cities become more human. Redefining industrial design to exist with nature. And redefining technology, so it actually can predict our needs on a daily basis. Many would and, and probably do say this is very ambitious. Um, I'm wondering what progress have you achieved so far? So indeed it's ambitious, but there is a vision and there is a plan. So let me just, based on how I described Neo, maybe share with you the progress. Regions versus sectors. As I said, we have multiple regions. We've launched four of them. Uh, at a high level, we've launched the line, which is a new revolution when it comes to urban design. The first vertical city where all your daily need is going to be within five minutes walking distance. The longest journey is going to be a 20 minute to reach to the international airport and it's 170 kilometer. The idea of the line that it will be able to host 9 million population by 2045 and today there is significant work already underway in the first few modules starting with the hidden marina and nearly 85 million cubic meter of earthwork have been done specifically on the line. The second one is Oxygen, which is our industrial city. It's a reimagined blueprint for the future of work that will be a place for every kind of company from game changing startup to Fortune 500 that will be able to produce new innovative products as well as green technology. And there is significant work that have been in place. We've launched the first green hydrogen power plant, which is in Oxygen, and that's going to be one of many to come. We've also launched the first green data center in mm -hmm. partnership with uh, Fast Energy. And we've also have taken over the port in uh, Duba port, now it's Oxygen, and we're doing major work of actually expanding and modernizing the port. So significant work in Oxygen. The two other regions, as an example, Trigina, which is a year-round mountain destination. And I think everyone heard about hosting the Asian Winter Olympics in, uh, in Trigina and in Saudi Arabia which people will ask, do you actually have snow there? Well, we do, but not as much as Davos. But we will be hosting the Asia Winter Olympics. It's a fantastic destination, you know, 2,600 meter above sea level, you know, creating a community, interconnected community around a, a mountain top lake with have a number of residential resorts and so on. And a lot of work is underway and, you know, the clock is ticking toward the December 2029. And finally, Sandala that we've just launched a month ago, uh, and it's actually one of the new islands that's in the Red Sea, connected to the Mediterranean. It's going to have one of the largest yacht clubs around the world with nearly 86 berths for yachts, and it's going to have a number of um, residential uh, ledger facility as well as a stunning uh, sea-viewed uh, golf course that's going to be there. And that island will start receiving visitors in early 2024. So that's the update on progress on the regions. But if you think of the sectors, the 14 that I spoke to you yes. about, at high level, we have a Neon Bay Airport that's operational. We have flights to London and Dubai on a weekly basis and a number of domestic flights. And we're actually developing the second runway that will be able to host in that airport 5 million passengers. 
Now, in parallel, we're building Neom International Airport, which will open in 2030, that have a capacity of over 100 million passengers. Uh, equally, we've launched two different subsidiaries, the uh, NOA, which is our utility subsidiary for water, water, power, and food, as well as Tonomous, which is our tech and digital subsidiary. Uh, we've created a joint venture with Volicopter and Mobility to introduce the future of mobility. We've done a partnership with McLaren to introduce the new E-Extreme formula, uh, as well as uh, done uh, in media more than 25 different production with global renowned names such as BBC, NBC, as well as uh, Apple TV. So a lot of progress on the ground have taken place. You've definitely been busy, and as we are starting 2023, um, thinking about you undoubtedly are building on the last five years, but what are you prioritising for 2023? So 2023 is going to be a big year. It's going to be a year of delivery for us in Neom. We have strict uh, targets and goals that we're all working as a team to achieve these goals. And I'll tell you the 2030 targets in which we'll prioritise what are we going to do in 23. By 2030, we need to have 1 million population in Neom. We need to create 380,000 jobs. Sandala's gonna open, the Trujina's gonna open and host the Winter Olympics. The Oxygen is gonna have over 90,000 population, and we're gonna contribute over 50 billion to Saudi GDP. So a lot of things that need to happen by 2030. And we are driving today the operational rigor to ensure all of the region that we've launched and the regions that is gonna be launched are gonna be delivered on time, quality, and cost. We're also driving commercial excellence to ensure all of our sectors, as they mature their spin into different subsidiaries. And most importantly, we're really gonna focus in 23 in building partnerships, yeah. because we know alone we're not gonna be able to deliver Neom. We need people who share the same values, same principles, and believe in what we're doing to actually be part of this journey with us. So absolutely to your point, it is ambitious, but it is happening now from the progress you just saw. And really we're here to you know, extend the arm and say Neom is happening. We're looking for people who actually share the same ambition as us to actually join us in building a future that is sustainable for everyone. And if you'd like to know more about Neom, please visit us in Neom Open House and we'd love to explain more details to you. Thank you so much, Dr. Minar. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Please welcome Nicholas Aguzin, the CEO of Hong Kong Exchanges and Clearing, and Bloomberg's Haslinda Amen. they asked a Singaporean born and bred to talk about Hong Kong. For the uninitiated, of course, <laughs> you would know about the competition between the two cities. Whatever Hong Kong loses, they say, Singapore gains. I'm not so sure about that. Now, Hong Kong has been one of the most isolated cities in the world for three years. No connection to China, no connection to the rest of the world. Some businesses left. About 3% of the population also made an exit. And in terms of assets, Hong Kong assets as well as Chinese assets collectively lost about $4 trillion in terms of value. And if you take a look at what's happening now, three years on, Hong Kong is back in business, mm -hmm. wanting to reclaim everything it lost, perhaps even more. So let's get perspective from Nicholas Aguzin. For those of you who know him well, he's known as Gucho, CEO of the Hong Kong Exchange, the first non-Chinese to hold that position, and since his taken over in 2021, he's been in the eye of the storm. Good show, good to have you with okay, us. thank you. Thank so this you. reopening <laughs> is a long time coming, and some yeah. say <clears throat> that the economic momentum will pick up so quickly that GDP will grow faster than Singapore mm -hmm. for the first time in 15 years. What's your own assessment of how quickly that momentum will pick up? So, um, first of all, thank you. Great to be here with you, Haslinda. I mean, it's, um, it's a great event. But uh, the, the, it's, it's hard to look at 
the Hong Kong opening by itself, I mean, you also have to look at what's happening in China. I mean, and, 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 and there's a lot of connect. I mean, our role is to essentially be a great connector. And that's why we want to be a great connector to every economic part of the world, including Singapore, and try to do as much as possible with Singapore and with others. But the, the linkage to China by being in Hong Kong, which is the most international city of China and the most Chinese city outside of the mainland. It's a very unique position. So we are very connected with um, the activities and what happens in, in, in the mainland. And the reopening of China in particular has been faster than what many people predicted. If I had asked you three months ago, I mean, will we be in this situation by early January of completely opening up? it would have been um, really difficult to predict that. So I, I, I do believe that the, um, the post-COVID reopening of China is going to be the most consequential positive catalyst to global markets in 2023. It's very significant. <clears throat> and of course, Hong Kong is in a very unique place to take um, advantage of all the opportunities that come out of this reopening and 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 so I'm, I'm 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 quite optimistic about the future there was um a meeting in in december around the central economic workforce conference in china which is where they set up a little bit of the parameters of what they want to do in the future and a lot of the policies there were very supportive of growth so so what will that translate to for the Hong Kong exchange? Are you looking at a better IPO pipeline? Are you looking at a boost in terms of trading volumes mm -hmm, for the next mm -hmm, maybe six mm -hmm. to 12 months? Yeah, yeah. Um, we've seen in, in the first few months already, in the first month actually, uh, which is the last few days, I mean, uh, activity picked up quite a bit. Our average traded volume is, is more or less 150 billion right now. And, <clears throat> and it was um, for the whole of last year on average 125 for the whole year. Now. We say it's been really tough. There were no IPOs in last year and all that. But in Hong Kong, we had 90 IPOs, 9-0. Okay. Um, I don't remember the exact number for Singapore, but <laughs> but, 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 it, <laughs> but it, it, it is it, the it, worst year since yeah, uh, the financial it, it, crisis. Very challenging year. But 90, 90, 90 IPOs raising around 110 billion Hong Kong dollars. And in the last month, in December, we had um, 20 IPOs in one month. And, and the second half of last year, it was four, time, four times more in number of volume compared with the first half. So we clearly see a prog progression. And the first half started very, very, very strongly. So, so I, 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 I do think that if um, uh, China reopens uh, the way that, that we're seeing it, and it'll be very positive, the Hang Seng Index since the beginning of November is up 40 percent. Hansen Tech Index is up 60 percent since you know November 1st. So uh, we 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 are seeing um, this translated in increased activity in the mar in the market, increasing interest. We're, uh, we're we're seeing lots of inflow, so it's it's positive momentum right now. As you said, the Hang Seng is actually having the best start to a year since 2018. Mm -hmm. You talk about those IPOs. Are you expecting mega IPOs? I mean, I know that you've been after the IPO of Saudi uh, Aramco. That failed mm -hmm. 2016, mm -hmm. 2018. Are you looking at getting that, perhaps? Yeah. I mean, Hong Kong has traditionally, in, uh, uh, since the listing reforms of 2018, become a mostly a new economy market. Um, we have had 254 companies go public that are like under the new regime since this regime was implemented. They raised about a trillion Hong Kong dollars of capital. So um, <clears throat> what I mean, what we want to make sure is that we, we are a market that, uh, that, that can be suited for like lots of companies. Right now, we're seeing a lot of Chinese companies in the technology area and the new economy area that want to list. Some of them don't fit the criteria, so we're adjusting. We're, we're, we're working on a new listing regime that would essentially allow companies with no revenues or with no profitability, but that they have high valuations, high investments in R&D, companies in, in artificial intelligence, quantum computing, space technology, areas that are a little bit different. So that requires that we adjust the regime to really fit the companies of tomorrow. Mm. 
Now, something you, you mentioned foreign companies that may be you know, coming to our market. And there is also a new uh, development that occurred in the last uh, few months, and, and it's been announced by CSRC and this SFC, that essentially, for, for the first time ever, international companies that decide to make Hong Kong their home for listing, listing Hong Kong, either dually listed or listed in Hong Kong, that they will qualify to be able to be bought by investors from the mainland. So this is very interesting because not only you're seeing the mainland trying to attract capital from international to invest in the mainland, but you're also seeing their opening up going to say, okay, this huge investment pool, which is very active, the retail of China, this is about one trillion of liquidity every day that they invest. They will be able to buy international companies that list in Hong Kong. And so Hong Kong will be the only market in the world whereby by being there, you're able to attract all the institutional investors from all over the world, the traditional institutional investors from anywhere that Hong Kong have been well known for many years, but also the domestic retail ba base, only market in the world. So this is a great development. We're going to be implementing this throughout the year, but we think it's a game changer for, for the future. Not too long ago, quite a number of Chinese companies listed in the US were at risk of being delisted. Mm -hmm. Now that risk has eased somewhat, and those companies were looking at dual listing in Hong Kong. Is that not part of the plan anymore? I mean, what are you hearing from those companies now? Oh, I mean, we, we have a lot of companies that, um, you know, want to have like a dual listing in Hong Kong. We, we, we have dual primaries. We still have like lots of them in the pipeline. Um, and, but our preference is that companies have an option to list everywhere. I mean, I'm, I'm very happy actually if there's an agreement and companies can list in Europe, in Singapore, in New York. That means that there's flow that there's transactions, that the, the East and West are communicating, there's connectivity, there are bridges being built. That is good because that means that investors will feel really comfortable mm -hmm. coming to Hong Kong, setting uh, up operations in Hong Kong and continuing to build that connectivity. You've talked about how you want the Hong Kong Exchange to be that bridge mm -hmm. between mainland China and the world. I mean, of course, China, a capital market of what, $25 trillion, mm -hmm. you say, mm -hmm. It will be worth about a hundred trillion dollars within ten years. I'm just wondering, with what's been happening in China and the reopening, is China trying to expedite that process or not? Yeah, um, I mean, I, I mean, I, 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 I'll just like speak for the capital markets itself. There, there is. I mean, if you look at global capital markets and the asset management industry globally, there's today globally about $120 trillion of debt and equity being allocated to different markets. And international money that goes into the mainland today, it's only about one trillion, only about 1%. It's very insignificant. It's, it's, it, the, the, the world is massively underinvested in China. Now you mentioned that the capital markets uh, of China, debt and equity are about 25 trillion. That's about a little over you know, 130% of GDP. If you look at most economy, that, th those, that number is somewhere in the range of four, five, 600 even percent. So the opportunity to grow that capital market and what you'll have is the economy of China will continue growing, but then the reliance of capital markets because today people devote most of their savings and resources to pu uh, put it either in real estate or in bank deposits, very traditional, you know, bank deposits. There's very little going into capital markets. That is likely to continue growing. That is part of an intent also that the market plays an active role mm. in defining the allocation of resources. And something important around COVID also that I, that I want to m make sure people know, over the last two years, savings in China, which traditionally is high, it's always like 20% of disposable income, it's very, very high. But over the last two years, that jumped to over 30%. So there's about $2 trillion of excess savings in the systems in China, $2 trillion. Now with the reopening, that will have to be allocated somewhere, to travel, to like purchase things. So that is a very significant amount. 
I hope that a good chunk of that comes to the capital markets. Good show. Needless <laughs> to say, a lot of investors have been bought by yeah. China yeah. because of the clampdown. We've seen that in the property sector. We've seen that in the tech sector. That seems to be easing somewhat because China keeps saying we are open, right? right. But yet, just in recent weeks, in recent days, in fact, we've seen a clampdown on brokerages, mm -hmm. Futu, one of them. I mean, how do you read that? I mean, should investors again be concerned about regulatory clampdown? Yeah. So, I mean, in sectors like um, internet um, and definitely the financial sector, most of my life I worked in the financial sector, so I know how heavily regulated those sectors are. I mean, we, we're probably going to have continued um, regulatory uh, intervention and, and try to you know, continue trying to see what are the right parameters that need to be set. This was very important in the, that what they call the platform economies and, and trying to set, how does this work? A lot of these phenomena are quite new. So every country around the world is trying to guess how to regulate this. What is the best way to regulate? The good news is that every message that we've been hearing over the last few weeks is that that process of rectifications of a lot of areas in the platform economy, internet economy, new economy that, that were not properly operated, they are being addressed and we're at the end of the, the, the process and so hopefully it, 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 um, you know, it generates a new wave of growth. I mean, we've seen some refinancing of very large um, uh, internet players and, 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 and the same thing goes for the financial sector. Uh, th you require licenses and regulatory um, um, permission to do certain activities, and, and we will continue hearing noise on this uh, here and there. But on the whole, the clampdown is over, you the, think? The, the messages that we're hearing around fundamentally platform economies is that the rectification processes and the fintech, I mean, most of that process is getting towards the end. Those were the messages that came, um, I think the, um, the, um, the chairman of CBIRC even publicly uh, mentioned that we're getting to the end of a two-year process of rectification. You've been in the position for about one and a half years yes. now. How challenging has it been? One, because you're the first known Chinese, yeah. and also when you take a look, at the management changes at the top, we've seen yeah. quite a few. I mean, is there difficulty in maintaining the team that you want, and is that impacting your day-to-day -day operations? Yeah, no, I mean, I mean it's um, obviously the markets were tough markets. I joined in uh, May 2021, which was like the peak from the markets. I mean, and, and, and since then, it, it, it was a tough market. We've seen then in October, end of October, the recovery that was, you know, quite, quite aggressive. So. But, but the, 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 the key thing is that I was like focused on the long-term fundamentals and that's why the message that we have is we're trying to create, build the marketplace of the future. And we're doing that by focusing on three areas. Number one is connecting China and the world. We have to look at our advantages and try to make sure that we can extend that to other areas. Second is connecting capital with opportunities. And the third, connecting today with tomorrow. In the process of doing that, actually, we managed to attract some great talent, actually. I, I mean, the, 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 the former CFO of the Brazilian Stock Exchange joined us, and he's like our head of strategy, corporate strategy. And we brought like many other talented people to the exchange. Uh, naturally, over, the, over time, as we start focusing on cent certain areas and making some progress on, on certain areas, we, we do have an opportunity to, uh, to, to promote new people, to get them in uh, uh, positions that they're more challenged. Six very difficult quarters. Yeah. Have your shareholders come to you saying, you know what, you have, I don't know, six months, 12 months to turn things around? Has there been a lot of pressure on you to turn things around? No. I mean, the focus is always on the long term and doing the right thing for the long term. We have achieved a lot. I mean, if you think about the initiatives connecting China and the world, there's been more initiative initiatives around connecting China and the world. We have ETF Connect. We have the announcement of Swap Connect. We're launching bond futures. We launched uh, an A50 equity index futures. Um, we have Southbound Stock Connect that is going to be settled in the RMB. I mean, there are so many initiatives that have been implemented 
over the last you know, year that our focus has been in execution, making sure that we create the right conditions for our company to thrive, and the market you know, will go up and down depending on you know, geopolitics, macroeconomics, a lot of things. We just have to do the right thing in the long term. Just a little question, we have eight seconds left. Okay. What, as we take a look at the year ahead, what are yeah. you most excited about? And what do you deem as the biggest risk? Well, I'm very excited about the, the reopening story and how that, that evolves um, and, and how this new chapter that, that we have of attracting international companies into our markets. I mean, I think that's going to be very exciting. What am I concerned about? I'm always concerned about geopolitics and the fact that that may derail you know, what we're trying to do. Taiwan, is it? Yeah. No, 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 not so much that one in general geopolitics. I mean, the conflicts between East and West. I mean, the purpose that, that one of the key things that we're trying to do is to minimize conflict and make sure that people are, you know, speaking to each other. Nicholas Aguzin, ladies and gentlemen, yeah. please join me in thanking him. Thank you. Thank you. Please welcome to the stage Walid Al Makarab Al Maheri, the Deputy Group CEO of Mabadla, and Bloomberg's Jessica Weber. Well, thank you, Walid, for joining us for the last session of our Year Ahead Lunch here at Davos. Um, I'd like to start and jump right in to what are the key mega trends that shape and inform Mubadala's investment strategy? Well, thank you for having me here. Uh, I know that this is the, uh, the, the end of what I hope is a great kind of set of sessions. So from our perspective, I'm not going to say anything that I think people sitting around these tables don't know. But from where we sit, a couple of mega trends, I think, have, have, have really determined how we look at the world. Number one, demographics. So you are seeing for the first time that inflection point between China and India from a population perspective. China is moving this way and India has now crossed and will soon be or is the most populous nation on earth. So clearly that will have implications on things like aging populations. What are we going to do from a healthcare perspective? How are we going to think about workforce evolution over time? What's the role of robotics if we try and think big? in terms of what the workforces are going to look like over the next 15 or 20 years? And finally, how do we fund retirement? And I know that's a huge unanswered question. Pension liabilities and how we think about that is obviously something that I think, broadly speaking, defines that demographic theme. So I think that's one. Number two, conflict. So we are seeing conflict, whether it's hard or soft, we are seeing a world that has moved from a very clear unipolar world to one that is multipolar. So when you think about the economic competition between the United States and China, clearly how you navigate that and find opportunity within that new world, whether it's through supply chains that are rearranging, whether it's through changes that we need to make, whether it's through a China plus two sourcing strategy that companies are making, things like that obviously color the way that we think about the world. Three, technology. Technology, artificial intelligence, how we increase productivity. So clearly how we think about productivity in many ways is going to drive growth or the lack of growth around the world. And so finding solutions for that and therefore investable ideas is something that we spend a lot of time thinking about. Artificial intelligence, you know, people are talking about chat GPT. Hopefully one day chat GPT will take my job. Right? Ask a question, get a couple of interesting investment pieces. So there's many others, but those are three or four that I think color the way that we view the world. And from your view of the world, how well placed is Abu Dhabi and the UAE to manage and benefit from these mega trends? So I suspect that, that a lot of people sitting around these tables have been to my part of the world before. So whether it's Abu Dhabi, Dubai, or, or, or the UAE, and, and you'll know that we're characterized by a couple of different things. 
Number one, we're physically small, but we're well-placed from a logistics capability and from a physical location. So it's easy to get to us, and it's easy to get to other places, and it's easy to have goods and services move through us. So most people know that. Second, agility. So we are able to reinvent the way that our government works. We are able to reinvent the way that our private sector and public sector relate to one another, thereby having an impact on how people invest in our countries. So that's incredibly important. And frankly, I, I think when you think about the most important element of how we're able to capture some of these big issues is really we have a long time frame. We are patient. We are able to think in terms of 10 years, decades, or longer. So we are not a fund that has to liquidate in five, seven, sometimes nine years. We're able to have the luxury of saying, look, I believe in what I'm invested in. I'm gonna stay for 10 or 12 or maybe even 15 years. Of course, we have the discipline of having to re-underwrite. We don't think idly about how we put our capital. But at the end of the day, if we think that something really has tailwinds, we will back it. And what about factors outside of your control? The, the global recession, a, a war in Ukraine, you've spoken about conflict as, yeah. a, as a driver of a mega trend. So, so there's, you know, what's really important from that perspective, ultimately from where I sit, is I worry about the unknown unknowns. Yeah. Yeah, what, what do you not know? And what, what, what's gonna hit you from left field? What are the next kind of black swan issues? So if we live in a world that's slightly more conflict prone than it used to be 10 or 15 years ago, and we are in an economic upswing, those are things that, that can be managed, I think, with the fullness of time. Again, you look for opportunity, you are ultimately very pragmatic and hyper-realistic. If you are all those different things, you'll navigate it fine. But the issues are, nobody can predict those black swan events. Yeah. And so what I do is I have as many conversations like this as possible. I learn, I try and figure out what some of those tail events might be, and then we try and plan for them. And as you help this audience plan, how do you think private sector organizations should consider and approach the mega trends that you're identifying? Well, I think private sector can do it better than we can, in the sense that the private sector is agile. The private sector knows how to sniff opportunity. And so the only advice I would give is private sector, guys, we, we make great partners. Come talk to us when you have wonderful opportunities because we love the agility and we love your ability to identify stuff and we're great partners. Come work with us and I bet we could do great things together. So Walid, I've got one last question for you and I, I think it's interesting to think about signals and what signals should investors look for in the coming months that would indicate possible economic recovery? Look, I, I think at the end of the day, the biggest issue that people are talking about and thinking about is inflation. So I've been here for just a little bit more than 12 hours, okay? And so I've had, you know, dozens of conversations in those 12 hours. And of course, I have heard the entire spectrum of economic prognostication. Some people think that we're poised for great growth. Some people think that, you know, we're doomed. And other people think that we're gonna float. So the truth of the matter is, is that nobody really knows. But I think what's different now from at least where we were with the previous cycle is inflation is a little bit more pernicious. And so we are looking, is it something that's going to be sustained? Is it something that will hopefully come down quickly? I mean, there are some very, very small, positive green shoots that we are seeing both in Europe and certainly in the United States. And of course, Asia is a big, is a big question mark. You don't have the issue of inflation in Asia, but you do have the issue of, well, how are these economies going to grow, especially China? China opened up like a light switch. <laughs> And, and I have an office there, as, as I'm sure many of the folks around the room have, have contacts there. Nobody would have been able to predict what happened in China. Uh, overnight, with, it seemed. Overnight, it, it, was, it was incredible. And so, you know, what's China going to do? Is China going to carry the world through growth? Remember, they did that in the past, not too long ago. They're gonna spur demand, or are they going to be a little bit more pragmatic about it and be more measured? And so we don't know, so we just have to see. But clearly we have to be prepared to take advantage of opportunity. Well, thank you so much. Thank you for thank joining you. us. It was great to be here. Thanks. And now I thank you all for joining us. That wraps our program, The Year Ahead at Davos. So thank you so much to our sponsors, Neom and Mubadala. And I really hope to see you at another one of our Bloomberg events this year.
marches on as Europe can here. Um, the backlash is public. We lost about four billion dollars of flows from various states. Um, but in long term flows last year, we see it and earned your government support that we could create. Um, uh, and the ways that we see it changing both digital across the board, net worth of our private bank clients. about $450 million, um, and that's, that's a lot. And these are the families who are the entrepreneurs that are shaping the world economy. Um, either they, they, they're typically first or the second generation, um, and they are the ones that know City well, um, because we've helped them go global. Uh, we've incredibly... <laughs> And it is through the 